And I think one of the big turning points was a conversation she had with me on the veranda where she says, I would rather be with you. You know, if you are so adamant and so much pain that you absolutely feel you must die, then I would rather you, you tell me and that I'm there with you than you do it alone in sort of this violent, lonely place. And that really was the ultimate um, demonstration of, of her opening up and saying, you can, this is how much you can trust me. Hello, beautiful people. On today's podcast, we have the beautiful Ocean. Ocean has completed a psychology degree with honours and is currently a midwife. Ocean is an author co-writing a memoir published in September of this year with her mother Cecile. The Silence Between Us, a mother and daughter's conversation through suicide and into life. I will preface this with saying that this podcast has a trigger warning as we cover topics on mental health and suicide. If anyone needs to seek mental health support, please call the numbers I have provided below. What I personally love about this conversation is Ocean's courage. Certainly mental health in its generalized sense is becoming a more accepted theme in our society to discuss. However, I still find that suicide has not had as much acceptance. Despite stigma that manifests personally as shame, Ocean shares very openly her experience of a former suicide attempt and how that has influenced her life over the last 20 years. Ocean shares how being labelled and medicated made her feel more helpless than helped. How being scheduled into a high security psychiatric ward was more traumatic than therapeutic and what it is like to rebuild trust at home after an attempted suicide with those close around you. We speak about intergenerational trauma, the importance of listening, of having an open curiosity, of experiencing human connection over isolation and of sharing your story. As the beautiful Brené Brown wisely says, shame grows on secrecy, silence, and judgment. We need to face shame with courage, openness, and empathy, and that is certainly what OCN has done. Please enjoy this very important and powerful conversation with the beautiful OCN. Welcome to the To Be Human podcast, OCN. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure. Um, I'm very humbled to have you as a guest, Ocean. I've I've read your book recently, The Silence Between Us, that you co-wrote with your beautiful mother, Cecile. And, um, you know, we were actually just discussing before I press record. It's It was a raw read. It was a very confronting read, but I think a very necessary read. Mm, so where I would love to start um, is to quote a part of your book and I sort of wanted to go to the crux of what, you know, your story sort of stems from and your journey. And so I chose to um, quote a, an excerpt from uh, the suicide note that you had written. And you said, I'm lost in the void of darkness that is my life. I want to be carried to the nothingness of my death, swallowed into emptiness. Mother. I don't know what I can say to stop the hurt I'm going to cause you. Please know that there's nothing that you could do. I know how much you love me. Please know how much I love you. And OCN, obviously, I spoke with you before press and record and got your permission to share this. And, you know, I wanted to explain to you and explain to the listeners the reason why I chose this is I just think it is so important to start here because I think for a lot of us that have not faced suicide directly, the way in which we relate to this is generally through statistics or secondhand information. And I think that can really separate the human aspect from this very real experience. Um, and I think it's important to note that there, you know, there are people behind these numbers and behind these stories. Um, and in mm. this case, you know, you're the person behind this note. And so I would love, OCN, for you to share, um, you know, as much as you were comfortable with, more about such a defining moment in your life in which you did write this note. Yeah, it's amazing hearing that quote. I've never heard it read to me and it gives me such goosebumps and mm. um, such a, a deep emotional reaction still, you know, nearly 20 years later. 
to mm. hear those words knowing that they were you know they came out of my my head and I wrote them down in that moment of such despair um I think for me it's that pure pain that you can feel when you're in that that depth of despair that hole of not being able to see that your life is worth continuing and um for me in that moment it was that thought obviously not rightly so but it was that thought that I felt so deeply that the pain I was in was greater than the pain I was going to cause by me doing what I then attempted to do you know moments later and I, I know in that note I had a little bit of insight that I was going to cause so much pain um, to my mum and, and to others I wrote a few suicide notes to different people and you know but despite that I was in such a dark place and it didn't happen overnight it wasn't spur of the moment and nor was it one simple thing you know so many people have asked mm. me over the years you know why did you do it or what what made you um you know suddenly decide and and I could give a different but honest answer every time you know sometimes mm. it was you know in my mind I think it was about the long-term pain that I had in my family growing up and, and the sense of aloneness and, um, you know, struggles I had from so many little events over my whole life. And sometimes I think it was a straw that broke the camel's back that weekend before I did it. And sometimes I think it was about how I was treated when I tried to get help. And they, mm. they're all right. They're all part of, of what got me in that situation. Um, and I think that's, you know, it's different for everybody. I think for some people there, there is a, a big event that they struggle with. Some it's a slow creep. Um, sometimes it's more about the depression or, or mental illness you're experiencing. Sometimes it's more about the situation you're in. And, and for me, it was more mm. about the situation I was in and not being able to see how to get out of it and not having um, enough support and connection around me to make me feel like I could stay afloat to get through it or um, like I could get enough help in that moment. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's so important. And I know throughout your story, you even mentioned that, you know, before, um, you know, you sort of went into that space of thinking about suicide, that you did try and seek health. You did go to a mental health mm. center, but you sort of speak yeah. about your experience being, they were more focusing on like, you know, labeling you, like putting you in a box and then feeding you medication sort of that was appropriate to that label. Can you share a little bit more about that experience? Because I do find it is quite a common experience for people and it's not always the most therapeutic. Yeah, and you know, I've thought a lot about that um, thing of labeling and, and diagnosis. And I think for some people that's really helpful and it's a really positive experience to get the diagnosis and know that there are medications or treatments that can help with that diagnosis. For me, it wasn't helpful. And I think it was two things. I think partly it was just that for me, it was more about the situation I was in and I actually mm -hmm. needed practical support to get out of that situation and then I needed probably really good therapy to help the longer term stuff um but you know so for me being sort of labeled and then just offered medication and nothing else was just made me feel more helpless but I think there's generally there is you know particularly back then in the mental health system just not enough resources not enough space time health professionals to address properly what I was going through. So I felt so just in round and out, here's the quickest way to fix this problem, have some medication, oh, it's not working after a few days, we'll just double your dose. Mm -hmm. And I, I felt really dehumanised in that system. I felt like they weren't listening to me, what I was trying to ask for. Um, they didn't meet me at the level that I was trying to come at um, and I don't think it was bad intentions or I don't think it was that they weren't good at their job necessarily I think they just lost that um, ability to connect on a human level and I think the services are not 
well designed for young people. They're, um, I don't think they meet the needs that you are when you're just at that junction of, of, you know, you're certainly not a child anymore. You're trying to find your independence. You're trying to do things for yourself, but your brain is still growing and developing and you're not actually completely capable of doing that. And I don't think the services really meet that need. And do you think in that moment that you truly understood what you were seeking, like what you did need, or is it sort of upon reflection now um, as more of an adult that you're able to see, like maybe it was more of that aspect of, you know, human connection and, and presence from people that you needed rather than sort of being medicated and sort of just more treated on that biological level, I suppose. Yeah, I I actually said it really clearly to the people I first saw at the community mental health centre that I didn't want medication um, and that I'd try to seek therapy, but that I couldn't afford. The only therapy I could afford was the free or $10 um, with student psychologists, which was, um, you know, didn't work out. And so I, Mm -hmm. I think I did try to express that and some of it is definitely from hindsight Mm. that um, I wasn't safe where I was living and that was compounding everything. And I needed really help to, to get out of that situation, um, which I did express probably not as clearly as I can express and and think about it now. Yeah. And so moving into, because I I find this incredibly interesting, the conversation of, you know, uh, seeking mental um, health help, because I think, you know, this is what kind of we can recommend, right, is if someone is sort of experiencing a mental health challenge, the first thing we say is that you need to go get help. But I find that Mm. it doesn't tend to always be that easy. And so when you um, did have your suicide attempt, and I know that, you know, eventually you got moved into a high security psych ward you were scheduled into. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about that experience? Because I know in that experience, you did describe it as like more traumatic than therapeutic. And I think for me, that was really incredible to read about from your experience Mm -hmm. because it does, it sort of opens the eyes up to something else rather than just sort of being like, seek help. It sort of made me think, well, you need to seek the right help. You need to be in the right space for that healing to occur. Yeah, that was, so I, at first I was in emergency and intensive care and then I was transferred to another hospital for surgery. And then once I was medically safe after that surgery, I was transferred to this high security psych ward and scheduled. And like you said, it was one of the most traumatic experiences of my life. It felt like a jail. I didn't feel safe there. The people who were around me were, um, they looked dangerous. They, you know, a young man approached me in this really creepy way. And having experienced a sexual assault that year that, you know, was part of the the build up to me attempting suicide being in that situation where I had both my arms in full plaster cast, completely weak, um, and then being approached by this you know, young man and, and feeling so scared and so unsafe was awful. And that place was, I mean, I don't think it was therapeutic for anyone, um, mm. but as a young person trying desperately to kind of find a glimmer of hope for life and and to try and heal both physically and mentally, it was, there was nothing there that was going Mm -hmm. to help that. And I was so distressed. I, by the time I got sort of triaged and seen by someone, it was, you know, around midnight and I was just beside myself with um, fear and distress and nobody had, you know, nobody was listening to me. I kept seeing a different psychiatrist, you know, every day they have to, when you're scheduled, and because of the, the intensity of my situation, I was being seen once or twice a day by a, a different psychiatrist. And I felt like nobody was really hearing my story. They wanted their tick boxes checked. They had maybe their own ideas. So one would focus on my family history that you know there was a lot of suicide and mental illness in my family. Um, some would focus on what had happened that year at, at the college with the sexual assault. Some would focus on something else. And I felt like this kind of 
puppet just going, you know, mm. along, trying to kind of convince them of how I was feeling or that I needed to get out, but also just kind of being taken on their little journey of what they wanted to to write down or tick. And that felt awful. You know, I really um, was so desperate to just feel safe. And I kept saying, you know, can I, can I go back home to my mum's? Can she look after me? Um, can I be anywhere else you know, but here? And, and they just, they would sort of seem all really nice and I'd get this sort of sense of hope that maybe they were going to listen to me at last and I'd open myself up, you know, so vulnerable, like such, you know, I would sort of clutch at this straw of, oh, if I, if I just completely open up and say this really honest thing that I'm thinking, maybe they'll connect with me and see what I need. And then I'd feel just shut down and they'd be like, oh, well, yep, you know, I'm going to stay the night here and somebody will see you tomorrow. And that just absolutely shattered me, particularly in that last night. I was only in that psych ward for one night, thankfully. Um, but that was just one of the the lowest moments in the whole, you know, of, event was mm. that that experience. Yeah. And to my understanding, you came across a man, uh, Dr. Martin. And yes. I'd love for you to share sort of, because, you know, even when I say that name, you know, you have a smile on your face and it's certainly so mm. different to the experience that you're just talking about. You know, how did that differ? Like why, what made this doctor so different to the other experiences that you had with the other doctors? Yeah, so I'd had this awful night. I'd been seen by one psychiatrist at midnight, told no, no choice, you're staying the night. Um, my mum had thankfully negotiated for me to be in a um, hospital bed just because of my arms in cast and all that and they'd given me sleeping tablets that I desperately didn't want to take but they forced me to take these sleeping tablets and I woke up the next morning and I was just, I felt hollow. I just, mm. like every ounce of me had just kind of bled out from that experience and then um, I knew I was going to be seen by somebody different and sure enough at you know 10 in the morning or whatever it was this new psychiatrist walked in and it was Dr Martin and I remember thinking so clearly in my head this is the last you know I've got to get out this is my last you know bit of hope I've just got to put everything into this and I really just <laughs> I gave it my all like I just <laughs> I spoke of why, I'd, why I was struggling in the hospital system. Mm -hmm. I explained about, you know, having to repeat my story to somebody different every time. I was really open. I didn't try to, I guess, um, give them the answers they wanted or, or, you know, that I'd tried maybe in, at the hospital earlier. And, and Dr. Martin was different. He listened to me. He, I felt like he didn't try to put a story in my head. He didn't try to take me down a particular path mm. um, to tick his boxes. He actually just listened. And he asked questions, but he did it with an open curiosity. And after, you know, 40 minutes or whatever it was, he said, you know, I'll, I'll go and talk to your mum if that's okay. Um, and I'd said, you know, I just want to get out of here. And he went and, and spoke to my mum and and. I didn't know at the time, but afterwards found out that, you know, he basically said to her, do you think you can look after her mm -hmm. at home? Um, and he acknowledged to my mum that what I really needed was, you know, good therapy, safe environment and good therapy. And I don't know whether he just knew that that hospital was not a good environment and, and accepted that being at home with my mum was a safer environment. Um what it was you know I mean I, I know they're desperate for bed so I, I probably there was an element for him that he was you know thinking yep I can free up this bed there's a, a parent here who's willing to look after this young person and, and that's what they both want and anyway and he walked back in the room and he said yep no worries you can go and I, I've, I've like it was the the worst <laughs> that I'd experienced the night before and that moment was the best um and just feeling heard by him and um, him giving me that trust mm. really meant a lot to me and I took it seriously and I, and I said to him, oh, you know, I'll call you in a year 
to tell you that you made the right decision right. and me saying that I, I meant it in that moment. Like I, it wasn't that it was completely smooth sailing from that moment on, but in that moment, I really did mean that I, I thought it was going to be okay. I thought I'd be around in a year to call him. And, you know, I unfortunately could never find him <laughs> to call him, <laughs> but I hope that, that one day he either reads the book or hears the story and, and knows how much it meant to me to be heard by him. Yeah. Beautiful. And talk yeah. to me about trust, OCN, because this is a, a topic that I find very interesting is, you know, you you have someone in your family that has attempted suicide and now they come home. And I know that, you know, you were sort of redeveloping your relationship with your mom. You were sort of trying to work out the kinks that you both had together in such a vulnerable mm. time. And there was that aspect and, you know, for anyone that hasn't read the book, the book is kind of separated between OCN talking about her thoughts and her diary entries and her mum's, and they're both written by themselves um, as individuals. And it's incredibly powerful to read it like that because you get both sides. And OCN, it seemed like from your point of view, you know, you were you were young, you were 18 years old and you had this sort of fierce independence that comes across in your story and you really wanted mm-hmm. to sort of remain in that autonomy Um but your mum also sort of wanted to be, you know, the mum in the relationship and in, in the way that she wanted to care and look after you. And there seemed to be that sort of challenging ac- aspect to your relationship that you were both trying to figure out where that line of trust is, particularly after an attempted suicide. And I think this is so incredibly important because, you know, I have no doubt that anyone else that has had that experience within their family I can only assume that that is one of the more difficult things in coming back into, you know, your day-to-day life after such an experience throughout different hospitals and psych wards and mental health centres and there's so much going on as you're saying, you're meeting different people every day telling your story to more of the silence when you get home Mm. and, you know, the, the reflection that comes with that. Could you share more about that time in your life? Yeah, it was a, you know, it was really tough but positive in the end on my mum and I, we had not had a good relationship for a long time. And I guess we hadn't had a lot of trust before. Mm. I um, had lost trust in my mum to meet my needs as a child. And it wasn't out of any bad intention or, um, you know, my mum being in any way, not wanting to be a a trustworthy mom. It was just the situation that we were in and she was so wrapped up in her traumas and um, the poverty and the difficulty of our family life and the the violence and the, just how overwhelming our life was that she couldn't often meet my needs. And so I'd, without even really realizing it, I guess had lost that trust over time and had become this independent person um very much pushed everyone away you know particularly her and then to suddenly be in this position where sort of I felt like my freedom was a bit contingent on me saying we you know my mum can trust me and I have to trust my mum because I couldn't do anything for myself you know I needed help showering still for um the first little while at home and so this trust need for trust was kind of forced on both of us and my mum was would have been terrified of whether she could trust me and we we had to negotiate these you know really bizarre things like am I allowed to sleep in a room by myself um how long could I be left alone for was I allowed to go out with friends was um you know my mum wanted a an intercom and should the intercom be on all night? <laughs> you know, <laughs> these um, these things that over time it changed about you know whether I was allowed to go on my own somewhere or you know who were safe friends for me to be with and and we had to negotiate that and it was really hard sometimes and we you know we challenged each other. I pushed the boundary and and um, but I think being you know forcing that situation also showed me that I could trust her and she 
was 110% there for me in that moment. I think mm. the shock of what I did and how close she came to losing me made her just completely focus on making me better and doing whatever was needed for that. Um, and so it really, it made us, it reset us, which was, you know, phenomenal for our relationship in the end. It really healed so much of that. And I really accepted um, that I had to trust her. And then she really proved herself that, that I could trust her and that she was there for me and vice versa. She um, really, you know, risked a lot to trust me and I think one of the big turning points was a conversation she had with me on the veranda where she says, I would rather be with you. You know, if you are so adamant and so much pain that you absolutely feel you must die, then I would rather you, you tell me and that I'm there with you than you do it alone in sort of this violent, lonely place. And that really was the ultimate um demonstration of of her opening up and saying you can this is how much you can trust me and I believe her she she you know um has never said anything that she hasn't meant mm. and even though it would have been incredibly hard for her to say I think she I, I knew she meant it and, and that um really opened up a, a new level of of trust between us yeah yeah that was definitely a very um uh emotional part in your book I should say it was um as a reader it was yeah very touching and and very confronting actually and Mm. I think you know because it was just so powerful between like a daughter and mother to have that conversation like it was Mm. just it was like the fundamental conversation in your experience it was just like it was everything it seemed in that moment and I'd love to understand it more from your perspective of because what I try and understand is I feel like you know a a lot of people including myself that have had mental you know health challenges a lot of it is stemmed from this feeling of isolation and lack of support and you know within that conversation that you had with your mum sort of saying that you know she'd prefer to be with you and you die you know with support and peaceful than alone and violent it kind of made me think like in that moment, was there an aspect of you that felt less pulled towards suicide because in that moment it felt like you were so supported and that you were not, were not alone? Yeah, I think you're right. I hadn't probably thought about it like that, but mm-hmm. that's true. It it was the ultimate um, message of no matter what, no matter how, much in pain, how awful, what, you know, whatever situation you're in, you will never be completely alone because mm. I'll always be there with you, even if it's for your death. And right. um, I'm sure my mum was very happy to never test out <laughs> Thomas <laughs> to me. Um, but, yeah, you're right. It, it was her saying, no matter what, I'll at least always be there, even if you, you know, yeah, have a hard life becomes. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like it's so important because I yeah, as I've shared, I I feel like such a deep aspect of these experiences stems from you know, that sense of isolation but also feeling not understood. And I felt like mm. throughout that conversation there was an understanding. It was kind of like even if I cannot totally understand, you know, your headspace and what you've been through, I understand that you will make the right decision for yourself and that I'll be there with you to support you, which I thought was very beautiful. Yeah. So I'd love to to know, Ocean, um, you know, a topic that really interests me is intergenerational trauma. And I know that you you mm. speak of this in your book and it's very clear that it, it is a topic within your family. And I was, you know, it was very confronting to to read about particularly your mother's side and, you know, the sort of mental health challenges that they've had, including sort of suicide and attempted suicide. And even you share, you know, you had a somewhat comparison to the experience of your grandmother and being in the Holocaust and, you know, she, she was raped herself. And, you know, it was, it's, it's, you know, they're very confronting topics, but they're very real topics. They're human experiences. And I think they're important to talk about. And I'd love for you to share sort of, 
what's your understanding now of sort of intergenerational trauma? As you've shared, you know, it's been 20 years since you attempted suicide and there's been a lot, I assume, that's happened during that time, including reflection of how family plays into our experiences and the choices that we make in life. And yeah, I'd love to know sort of where you sit with your understanding with that now. Yeah, I've thought a lot about it, particularly in regards to parenting. Um, Mm. That's one of the biggest things that's happened to me in the last 20 years is becoming a parent. And that always makes you reflect on how you were parented. And looking back, I think having that openness with my mum about her life and and also understanding my paternal side as well um, through stories, I've really reflected so much on how the way that my parents were parented affected how they parented me and then seeing you know, how, how I then make choices about how I parent. And you know, for my mum in particular, she came from such a um, difficult, authoritative, traumatised family. Her, my mum's mum had lost her mum very early and had been through some just really tough things in her life. And my mum's dad was in the army, very high up, and there were lots of um, bomb threats and, um, you know, instability and um, very harsh discipline and very strong shaming messages Mm. that my mum received as a child. If she, you know, wet her pants or if she behaved not right, there was, particularly as a girl, the boys in the family were treated very differently. But as a girl, she was really traumatized, and she, um, you know, she had um, sexual assault as a very young child, and then again as a young adult. And I knew all those stories from it, you know, as a child, which was actually too much for me as, a, mm. you know, as a five-year-old to know what rape meant and to know what all these things were. But I could see. You know, reflecting and even as a teenager I, I think I understood and could reflect on this but I can do so even more now is seeing how she was raised and the traumas she had when she came to Australia and my parents had nothing nearly but they kind of came here from the other side of the world from Europe and were my mum was pregnant with my eldest brother at the time and they were really escaping mm-hmm. their own family history and and they were starting fresh here and you know my mum I know was trying to shake that um overly authoritative and and traumatizing life she'd had which had affected so many of her siblings you know she'd had a sister suicide and multiple other siblings attempt suicide or harm themselves permanently in their attempts and she wanted you know, the opposite for her children. And so we were raised in this incredibly um, free range way, which had its amazing moments, um, but also didn't work. You know, it, it, mm. For me, it really showed intergenerationally how when you swing the other way, it's not, it's not healthy either. And right. it's, um, I think it's so important to be able to stop and reflect and not just react to uh, what you've inherited intergenerationally and not just um, respond by swinging the other way in that sort of reactive, I just want to escape that, so I'm going to do the opposite. And that's, I think, what what my parents both did. And, um, yeah, so for me then, and I've thought so often, and for a long time I didn't want children because I was terrified of what I would pass on intergenerationally Mm. um and you know it wasn't until I sort of met someone and fell in love and all of a sudden you're just drawn to that you know having a family and babies together and um but it has made me stop and reflect so much about the way I parent and I see little things you know I um you know we were brought up with no rules there was no boundaries and um there was no safety then and Mm. I realized even though my parents never intended for that to cause so much harm. They thought they were doing the right thing. Right. It, for me, actually made me feel so unsafe. And as I've reflected and you know read things, 
I realized that as a child, if you don't have that sense of safety and security, it can make you feel not loved, even though that was absolutely not what either of my parents, you know, I know that they did love me deeply and completely, but it, when you're little and you feel unsafe, and there's the you know low boundaries and um, that's, I guess, the, the result. And so I have you know, really tried hard, I guess, to break that pattern in my own parenting. Um, you know, it's not always easy. You realise how much um, can just come through still, you know, but I, I, I see it and I, I guess I, I reflect and, and my partner and I talk about it a lot of trying not to repeat that history. Yeah. Yeah, it's such an interesting topic. And I mean, even you sharing that, I think of, you know, my own, experience in my own life and you know my my mother had a very um she was adopted and she had more of a free reigning experience um which Mm -hmm. I think she interpreted as not being loved and so you know as an only child single mother she became very overly protective but as you're suggesting it sort of goes too far the other way and I ended up moving out of home at quite a young age because of that Mm -hmm. so it's incredibly fascinating sort of to see even in our own experiences, kind of the opposite <laughs> of, of what happens when, you know, they sort of um, do the, the opposite to what they experienced and how that can affect if it is kind of more on the extreme sides of things. And I think, you know, it's interesting in my own life because I, I think, okay, like my mum had all this freedom and I was like overly protected, you know, do I, mm-hmm. do I meet somewhere in the middle? But I think, you know, as you've probably experienced with your, your own beautiful children that like you really can't know until you have those children. I think that's something that's so beautiful about having children as well. Like it obviously is probably life's biggest challenge, but I think, you know, day in, day out, there is always that opportunity to to grow within yourself and to change that trajectory of your family. And I think there's something really honorable and beautiful about taking sort of that responsibility on and being like, you know what, like I am going to become more of a conscious being in this experience and and decide to create what I want for myself and my family's future rather than sort of reacting to 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 the hurts of the past. Yeah. Yeah, it's right. It's it's trying not to react because that makes us you swing often too far yeah. <laughs> and, and and doesn't make you come from the quite the right place. Um, yeah. Yeah. So what's it been um, like, you know, that to my understanding, writing has been really cathartic for you and your mother. What has it been like to sort of come together? Because as you share, you know, around 20 years ago, your relationship with your mum was quite fractured, but it seems to mm. sort of have deeply developed since then to the to the extent that you have written a book together. And, and I would love to know more about that healing journey of coming together and sort of writing more about that moment and sort of the growth that's come through that. Yeah, the, it's interesting because I have thought a lot about this, particularly now that we've published. So we had yeah. the, the writing process first, which was really has been quite different in some ways to the publishing. It's been two different things. And the writing for me has really helped the trauma. And for my mum, she has, you know, we've talked about it and writing, she really wrote in the moment. So she'd have this Mm. little notebook in the hospital corridor and she'd jot things down. And then afterwards she'd spend a couple of hours on the weekend writing it out um, and remembering every detail. And for her, by remembering that detail and going over it and then rewriting it, it was processing that trauma. She, um, It's a lovely concept. She talks about this word, remembrement, which is a French word. And it's used in France um, to talk about when they had all these tiny farms in the countryside and none of them were very sustainable because they were all fractured and, and separate. And remembrement was the process of bringing together farms into one bigger one to make them sustainable and and to thrive and so she talks about you know trauma shatters your sense of self Mm -hmm. and writing and processing it brings that shattered self back together be stronger which is yeah so for her that that's what the writing process really did and for me it was it was the same I I don't think I realized how much trauma I held inside Mm me about my suicide attempt, like even the the viciousness of what I did to myself and that violence really 
played on my mind for for so long and you know never mind all the the stuff that happened before or the the experience mm. in the hospital all those things together created so much trauma in me that I still held very locked inside um because I hadn't quite shaken that sort of silent habit <laughs> um and so I wouldn't talk about it easily or or share and so writing it down really helped me process that and um it stopped I had this sort of inner dialogue that would just replay this story in my head and that's what made me sort of suddenly say to my mum hey I want to write about this and you know I want your voice in it because I was just sick of it going around in my head and when I wrote it out the first time you know just copying out diaries and emails and all those things I realized it stopped playing in my head which was wow. such a relief <laughs> so that really um I think it helped us individually with our own trauma and then doing it together and trusting each other to read each other's most personal intimate mm -hmm. thoughts was healing for our relationship and I think by working through our own trauma and my mum had probably worked through her own trauma in her own way because she'd done that writing already and she'd mm -hmm. shared it with some friends so I think she probably was a bit ahead of me in, in processing that trauma and I sort of caught up with that and then we had this sort of incredible healing um, experience of, of going to this writer's retreat and reading each other's stories for the first time. I put yeah. them together in sort of chronological order, but not read them in detail. And then we sort of sat and read each other's um, in order. And it just, it blew us both away what we had both seen. You know, sometimes it was the same nurse and I'd interacted with them about one thing and then my mum had had ran into them in the hallway and, and it's just all these little moments where we had each other's um, perspective one that still sends kind of chills down me of you know in, in a positive way is when I went to see the GP you know my old family GP who I'd known for a long time as a child when I'd gotten out of hospital and I had to go check in and about you know post-op and all that and I had this really positive, warm experience with him. And then I'd sort of walked out, you know, striding out independently as I, as I do. And my mum had seen his face watching me leave with just tears running down his face. And I hadn't seen that. I, mm -hmm. you know, I'd had this positive conversation with him and felt like I was going to be in good hands with him as my GP again in my old hometown. And if yeah, hearing her side of watching him, watching me <laughs> walk out, um, you know, a lot of those moments just really brought about such a sort of solidity to my sense of connection and, and feeling grounded again. And so that, yeah, I think that writing really changed again, that coming back to that concept of trust, it really, you know, we had to trust each other to share. Um, and then working on it together, it allowed us, I think, just to have that conversation but with that bit of structure and, and security of our diaries and this project um, and over time, you know, it really changed our, our openness. You can't, I think, share such um, intimate thoughts that you've just written down for yourself and you can't share that with somebody else without it changing your, your relationship, mm -hmm. which was amazing. You know, it really, really did change us. And then publishing feels like it's been a whole different step. I mean, partly the the editing process really makes you go over and over. Right. And I think that that does um, help you see things differently, um, have, you know, more depth with your insights about it. And it also just it helps take the trauma out of your body because you're working on it oh. on a computer or on paper in a cafe. Mm -hmm. And so it just really helped to actually physically feel like it just, big lump of trauma and, and just sat it out of, of my body for a, wow. a while, which has been quite lightening. <laughs> you know? um, and then publishing, I think, beyond just that processing of the trauma and, and reconnecting my mum and I, it's really helped me process the shame because you can't mm. put yourself out there like that. You know, shame is so much about secrecy and feeling like you need to hide this, you know, terrible facts about yourself because they're so shameful 
and publishing is like the ultimate <laughs> way of, of saying <laughs> there is no shame about this. Yeah. I'm not going to keep this secret anymore. I'm not going to keep this silence. Um, and I didn't expect that. I, I thought it was just about trauma and just about our relationship. But now with publishing, it's like, oh, actually, there was probably still a fair bit of shame in me about it all. Um, and I still get a little lump in my throat sometimes when I realise that this person that I know, you know, a colleague or somebody that I know but not that well is going to suddenly find out all this stuff about me and I can still feel that like, oh, what are they going to think about me? And putting it out there, you, it just, you know, every time I do it, every time I, I realise that it's gone out a little bit further, um, it, it removes a bit of that shame. It makes me practice <laughs> feeling okay of not feeling shame, that it's, you, you don't have to feel shame anymore. Um, I think it's something I hung on to so long that uh, it, it's hard to actually really let go of it. And I'm sure it's never going to be completely gone in all situations, but every every step helps. Yeah. Yeah, we had a um a beautiful lady, Heather Ellis. She was a guest on my podcast and she sort of kept within her, I think for around 20 years actually, that she was HIV positive. And, mm. you know, there's so much sim- similarity between your stories in that in that description of like holding, like there's a heaviness within your body. And I think you know, the symbolism of that is so important that like it is, you know, it is that shame that you're holding on to and it's that sharing of your story and it's like in its whole wholesome truth and rawness and vulnerability and the way that it's uncomfortable is sort of that letting go is as you shared, you feel lighter. And I think that's so, like it's so important to reiterate to people that you need to share your stories as, you know, so much of trauma is just, founded on the fact that no one was, you know, you weren't weren't able to share your story and be listened to. Mm. And there's so much power in that, you know, we can make these things so complex at times, but sometimes all we need is just someone to be really present with us and and to listen to everything that we have to say and to not come from that judgmental, you know, aspect, but one of compassion and just to receive and, Mm. you know, things may be hurtful towards the other, but just to not make that about them in that moment and to just hear you. And I feel like that's what you and your mom have done so well is that you've just laid it all out there, like absolutely everything in all its rawness and vulnerability and confrontation. And um, there's just something so inspiring about that OCN that I just really, really appreciated about your story because, you know, even as we start this podcast, you know, I read an excerpt from your suicide note and I think for some people that can be really confronting. But I think, you know, as you share, it's like, the whole purpose behind you sharing this story and publishing this story is to remove that stigma, is to remove that reaction that there's something wrong in speaking about these topics um, Mm. because it is very real. And I think um, you did an interview recently uh, with Pat, I think it was on Glee Glee Books or something like that. And, you know, he he shares about like youth suicide, you know, being the highest uh, rate of death in in Australia and, you know, higher than car Mm. accidents, but like, you know, we don't speak about it. And I think that, yeah, I I hope you feel so proud internally. And I hope that shame continues to lift from you that because you're, you know, you're stepping up and you're being courageous and you're doing something that not many people do. And you're certainly at the forefront of it in Australia. And yeah, I just hope you're so proud of that. Oh, thank you. (laughs) (laughs) So I would love to know, Sian, uh, before we finish, you know, and don't overthink this, but I think for anyone out there that is, you know, having, experiencing some challenges with their mental health, they may not be suicidal and they may be, but, you know, coming from your experience, which is is such a powerful teacher, you know, you are a woman of wisdom through through having your own experience and growing through it. What would you share with them about, you know, how to how to act with something like this? Because as you said, you felt quite isolated. You know, what would you sort of advise for them to do to be able to truly help themselves? Um, A few things. I think I realised how important it is to have some sort of continuity of care with the Mm. health professionals around you. Because I think that's where I really came undone was that I was in a new place and I didn't reach out to, you know, my old GP or to um, 
people where I, I might have had a better reaction and, and been able mm. to have a bit more safety and security to share how I was feeling. And um, so I think that's, in hindsight, I wish I had done that. And I think that that can be a really positive experience for people is, is to reach out to a trusted health professional. I think there are some better places now, um, like Headspace and youth mental health services that are not as scary and unwelcoming to young people and who have better experience in, in dealing with that. I think there's still a long way to go. and I hope we can get more funding in this area to create more safer spaces, but um, there are a lot, uh, you know, a lot around. Um, I think the other thing is being able to read and share stories about other people's experiences. And when mm. I was in that situation myself, I Googled and Googled for other stories about suicide or youth mental health. And there was so little or nothing at the time that I mm. could find. And I hope that having this story and, and people sharing this book and that there are perhaps, you know, more um, voices out there of shared, you know, sharing stories. Um, and you know, part of that is is the media being less scared to mm. to publish these stories and and not worry that it's going to suddenly make everyone copycat suicide and that actually there is power in in sharing those stories. I hope that you know anybody listening to this who is in that situation, I hope they can hear my story of you know hitting absolute rock bottom as bottom as you can get and finding my way out again that there mm. is no bottom low enough <laughs> that you can't get out of um and if anything that nearly makes the um place you can get to feel so much sweeter <laughs> because you've experienced that and I hope people can can trust that there is no shame in being in that really dark place and it is part of, you know, what makes you human to be in that um, vulnerable, dark, lonely place, but that you can get out of it and that there is, um, you know, opportunity and and so much more to, to experience than that. But that it's okay to be there. There is nothing shameful mm -hmm. about being in that place. It's just about finding the support and help you need to get out of it, whatever that is. And for some people that is absolutely medication, for others it's therapy, for others, it's exercise or a combination of all of that. And wh whatever the way is for you, that's that's fine. There is no no wrong way of, of getting out of that place as long as you um, know that you can. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much, Osean. I just, I appreciate you sharing your story and I appreciate all the advice that you've just shared. It's it's so important. And as, as you have shared, you know, we do learn from others' experiences and other stories. So Thank you so much. And I would love to ask you, Ocean, on a final note, what does it mean to you to be human? Um, I'm excited about answering this question. Oh, good. <laughs> that, yeah. I, might, I might waffle a little bit. Oh, I no, please. <laughs> I, think, I, mean, I think very personally for me, I'm a bit of a um, diehard optimist, no, you know, pun intended, um, <laughs> I, you know, for me, I, I have this kind of overall sense of hope uh, about life and it's not, it's not that it always has to be rosy, but it's about being able to accept those imperfections and failures and uncertainties and still find those moments of, you know, beauty and joy and, mm -hmm. and life. Um, I think broader, it is about, you know, having that sense of safety and security um, to experience life beyond your little patch. And that's, you know, when I was in that dark place, I had such blinkers on and all I could focus on was me, myself and I. And in my early recovery days, I had to in some ways be so selfish and just think about myself. And then coming out of that, I realized to really like embrace being human is lovely to be able to see outside of that and to think about other, you know, and not, not, good the good the bad the ugly it's about distressing situations overseas it's about tough things as well as as beautiful things but it's um so lovely to to look at humanity 
with broader lenses than than I had at that time. Um, and then I think lastly, I'm a midwife and I love my job. I just enjoy it so much and I get so much out of it personally. And I think I had a beautiful shift this week with you know, beautiful birth that just for me summed up perfectly what it is to be human, which is, you know, there can be a fair bit of mess and pain, which, you know, <laughs> labour and birth can be yeah. um, at times messy. It's certainly not a, you know, stroll in the park. <laughs> but then there is this, you know, gasp when a woman meets her baby for the first time and realises she's just given birth and she's just been through all this, you know, tough, um, intense moments of, of labour you know, for this moment of meeting her her little baby and that sort of perfection and hope and, and love for this new baby is, you know, I've, I've never felt more human than when I've birthed my children or seen another woman birth her child and that just is that ultimate moment um, of, of humanness, yeah. <laughs>